Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Penny Livingston to talk about her experience with urban permaculture. Penny is internationally recognized as a prominent permaculture teacher, designer, and speaker. She holds an MS in eco-social regeneration and a diploma in permaculture design. Penny has been studying the hermetic tradition of alchemy and herbal medicine making in Europe and the United States for the past four years. Penny has been teaching internationally and working professionally in land management, regenerative design, and permaculture development for over 25 years and has extensive experience in all phases of ecologically sound design and construction, as well as the use of natural and non-toxic building materials. She specializes in site planning and the design of resource-rich landscapes integrating rainwater collection, edible and medicinal planting, spring development, pond and water systems, habitat development, and watershed restorations for homes, co-housing communities, businesses, and diverse yield perennial farms. Welcome to the show today, Penny. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited that you're here. Thanks for being here. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Well, let's see. Um, My background is in uh, landscape design and textile design. Hmm. So I was doing a lot of work. Uh, in the 80s and 90s for um, single-family residences, commercial, and uh, developers, new Mm -hmm. development. And at the time, I was doing a lot of organic and native plant um, landscaping back then. Uh And um, I guess I just started getting... But I think my road to taking my first permaculture design course was it was almost faded <laughs> <laughs> you know i kind of closed one door with a client uh-huh. who was just i just walked away from a large job and was sort of getting tired of kind of comforting the rich mm. and going mm-hmm. through a crisis of consciousness around um what am i doing with my life and a permaculture course was starting up at lost valley education center uh-huh. in oregon near eugene with Tom Ward and Jude Hobbs and Rick Valley. Oh, my and gosh. And I, I just j- jumped on the, the, actually, the person who started that community, a woman named Diane Browsey, was at our house when this was all going down. And she says, well, we're starting a perm- permaculture class this weekend. And I had no clue what <laughs> permaculture was. And I just, I, it was a t- completely intuitive uh-huh. thing. Like, this door's opening. I'm going to walk through it. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. But something feels fated here like this door's closing and this door's opening so i want to so i I went up there not knowing anything Uh uh-huh actually the thing the part about permaculture that really was the hook for me was about community economics oh yes 
And um, so I took that class, and it was great. It was kind of transformative. I didn't, I couldn't really talk about it to anybody because back then, you know, they, it, it was a lot of lecture, a little bit of hands-on, and mm-hmm. nobody really knew anything about permaculture. And then, you know, they kind of put all this information in your head and then kind of spin you around and send you out the door. And I was kind of like, whoa, <laughs> now what? Right. And there was a small group of people here in the Bay Area called the Bay Area Permaculture Guild. Wow. And back I in the 80s. Kinda, back in the early 90s. Wow. Uh-huh. And I found some flyer about how to, you know, it was a one-day introduction to permaculture workshop, and I I thought, wow, how could they even talk about it in a day? This is going to be interesting. <laughs> so I went, and I kind of hooked up with them, and... Um, we would do like little introductions and it gave me a little bit more and then eventually I ended up taking a course with Bill Mollison down in Texas at Fossil Rim Mm -hmm. and somehow I don't know why it's so unusual for me but I ended up getting into the in crowd there and got to know the inner circle and then later when Bill came to the Bay Area to speak I think at the Bioneers they called me and asked if I could host him oh wow at my house and I'm like sure nice (laughs) So we became very good friends, and Mm -hmm. he's visited numerous times, and um, we've spent a lot of time, you know, like driving and looking at landscapes. So I I learned a lot from him. I also, he came and taught a a two-week PDC here in Sonoma County, and during that time I had to kind of babysit his bulldozer operator, and so his name is Doug. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, we decided to go dig a pond together up at some <laughs> land we had up north, and right. we went up in Trinity County, and where it gets it can get as much as ten feet of rain up there in a very extreme wet season. Wow! And then of course by June it's just all runoff and dry. Mm-hmm. So we put in some swales and ponds with him and some very kind of steep land, and it all was so successful. I learned tons. Oh, and then sure. I did a pond building workshop I organized with Bill. So I, I did a lot of water harvesting with Bill and his bulldozer operators. So uh-huh. I learned a lot. And then just in my own life, it took a while to kind of, I was sort of straddling conventional landscaping with permaculture for a few years, actually, because there was nobody to go to. There was no right. examples. There yeah. was no sites other than up in um, Orcas Island. I went up and traveled and saw Doug, the, Doug Bullock, and there's uh, some brothers, the Bullock brothers up there, that mm-hmm. had a beautiful 10-year-old food forest that I got to see. But by and large, I kind of invented what permaculture looked like for me, and uh-huh. it involved, um, well, you know, I come back, I had three quarters of an acre here, and I just started kind of sheet mulching and planting fruit trees and then we had a lot of snails and slugs on our garden there uh-huh. and so we could barely even grow a daffodil the mm. flowers would get eaten right so i decided you know i don't have a, a bug problem or a snail problem i have a duck shortage <laughs> i love that <laughs> where that came from we call that and stacking I, functions right yeah and so i dug a pond and, and you know it's kind of those things where i'd rather you know, raise ducks and kill snails, and I was kind of like, well, I'd rather sit by a pond than change duck water, Mm because you know you have to change the water all the time. And so I dug a pond, and then from the earth from the pond, I was also at that time by then teaching at San Francisco Institute of Architecture. Mm -hmm. And I was really taken with earthen, you know, cob construction. Oh, yes. I'd seen my first cob building up at Aprovecho that Yanto and Linda, Yanto Evans and Linda Smiley built. Mm Mm-hmm. And that was, I think, the first Cobb house ever built in the U.S. And I saw that, and just, I couldn't believe you could build a house made out of dirt balls. Dirt, I know. <laughs> so I had all this subsoil from digging the pond, so I built an office out of Cobb and hosted a workshop and built the first Cobb structure in California. Nice. Here. And so it was kind of like building habitat, you know, you'd make dig a pond and you can mm-hmm. and also my roof water was going in the pond. I was also it was processing my gray water. It was feeding my ducks, you know, habitat for my ducks, habitat for other uh critters, frogs and fish and um mm-hmm. birds. Nice. And it was also offering kind of a southern reflection to help ripen some grapes because we're in the co- uh, California coastal maritime right. climate here. Uh-huh. 
And so it had all these functions, and then the soil from the pond built my office, and where I did a lot of permaculture design for the next 10 years out of that, and that building is still there. My son is living there, and my grandbaby was born there, and they're attending the food forest that's now, you know, 20 years old or, or more, and they're just chowing on mulberries right now. I can hear them right. crunching the mulberries on this big tree that I planted and all the pears and apples and plums wow. and fruit, nut trees, walnuts and berries. They're just loving it there. And so that's kind of the true regeneration is yeah. where where this all goes and it goes into your, you know, kids and grandkids. Right. Then I think that's a success and so we, we finished that project, and then we moved to a nonprofit uh, called Common Wheel, where we have a larger piece. It's a 17-acre um, farm that we, mm-hmm. we, we put a food forest in about four acres here, and we have aquaponics and bees and chickens. We had goats for many, many years and milked goats and made cheese and yogurt and mm-hmm. did a whole dairy thing here for a while. And um, That's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but we're just getting now to the place of completion of this project where the trees have taken hold. We're getting lots of, it was all apples when we came, Mm -hmm. and a few pears, and now we've got plums and apricots and apriums and um, pluots and plumcots and mulberry and walnuts and hazelnuts and um, chestnuts Mm -hmm. we're growing. And so we've just diversified, and then we have a whole medicinal understory here of um, because I do a lot of uh, medicine making now right. on herbalism yeah. and distillation. So I'm going to be distilling a bunch of rosemary tomorrow, making oh, nice. oil. And oh my gosh! From that's the garden, a- so we just walk out, and it pretty much everything is right outside yeah, our yeah, door, so and it yeah. really works. <laughs> Yeah, I'm that's a testimonial. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, in the, you know that the, you have in the past ten minutes, you've planted so many seeds. I I could probably do about four hours with you. Um, right. <laughs> so, thank you for that. And one of the overarching pieces of the conversation is how interconnected everything is in your space. Can you say more about that? Yeah, well, it's I I don't even know where to start. I mean, <laughs> well, let's start with the water. Perfect. You know, it's Perfect. all about the water. Yeah. And without the water, we couldn't do what we're doing. Especially and, in California. Yeah, and when we came here, there there was no information about the water. We had to look at the land and we found a little dinky winky trickle of a spring. Uh, at the top of the valley, mm-hmm. which happens to be, this valley is a due south, north-south facing valley mm-hmm. where we put most of the garden, and we found this little spring, and through environmental health of our county, we found about a, out about a slow, filter, slow filtration sand filter that requires oh. no, a very little pressure, uh-huh. like no pressure, and wow. we just use this ma- wonderful tool called gravity <laughs> <laughs> for all Hey, of everybody's water. got it. Yeah, right? And so we located everything relationally uh-huh. to the garden, the tanks and everything, so we have enough pressure, high, they're high enough in elevation, uh-huh. so we have enough uh, water pressure to run drip lines and stuff here. Wow. So we did that, and then we also put in a lot of swales and, and, and infiltrated every drop of water mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. for the last uh, 12 years, just, you know, we'd have a permaculture class, and you know, on water day, we go out there and like, okay, team, let's build a swale. swale. We build another swale. And so we've been harvesting all this water, and it's been infiltrating into the aquifer below us. Mm-hmm. And um, the other amazing thing is that uh, 35 years ago or so, this whole zone was completely denuded. There were no trees. It was cattle land. Oh, right. And it was just like, you know, overgrazed pasture mm-hmm. on all the ridges and everything. Mm-hmm. And they pulled the cows off about 35 or 40 years ago. And we've been here for 13 years. But the dug fir trees have all grown up on the ridges. Oh, yeah. And because we're really foggy and there's no agriculture up there now, it, the fog, the trees harvest all the fog and have been feeding the aquifers and the spring that we oh, use and we rely on. Nice. Apparently, the people who first came here mm-hmm. 35 years ago, that spring was dry. And now it's just very reliable. Mm-hmm. We've just gone through a five-year drought and that our cisterns have been full the whole time here. 
And then we also have roof water. We also have a pond that we have a solar pump that pumps water up to 5,000 gallons on a ridge and it gravity feeds down. So we keep those full. Mm -hmm. And that's got, that's a different, more developed. We developed that about seven years ago. Wow. So we've got, you know, three different water streams here. Um, no, no city water, but we just rely on the water we have and we honor it and we manage it and we catch it and store it and use it. And um, so that's Beautiful. And the main framework. And yeah. then, then you've got the trees and the forest related to that. And then you've got the animals and the birds that come and the foxes. We have foxes and bobcats that are oh, our nice. rodent mm -hmm. p control yep. people. And um, the birds are just doing, and the butterflies and the hummingbirds are all doing their pollinating. Just, and yeah. we have bees. We have nine hives here. Oh, wow. And, Lots of honey. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have that's a lot of honey. honey, and so, yeah, and that's all related to the plants, and then mm -hmm. the plants are related to not only the habitat and the birds, but also to us, so that I can go out and, you know, really, I, would, I don't have to go to the grocery store if I don't want to. I go to get things I like. Right. But I don't have to, I mean, I could thrive just outside my door mm -hmm. as we speak right now. Oh, Everything is there. There's the dream, right? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Here at the Urban Farm. Well, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, well, no, that's a great place to start. Uh, here at the Urban Farm, we probably get about 30% of our food out of the yard, but we're smack in the middle of 4.4 million people. So, I, And you're I, hot. And we're hot. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, we're hot here. So, <laughs> I don't know how you do it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I've been here for 49 years now, so it's just, uh -huh. it's just what is, you know? Yeah. So yep. you mentioned something that I, that I want to uh, define a little bit better for our listeners that don't know what a swale is and why are oh, they right. important. Can you kind of touch on that? Yeah, well, you know, commonly, especially here in California, through like running large animals mm -hmm. on the land or large equipment on the land or through development of dehydrating the landscape, and if you have you know, clay-based soil, which we do a lot. It's mm -hmm. not clay, it's sand, and then nothing, you don't want to do anything with the sand because right. it's already infiltrating. But with clay, once it gets compacted, um, you end up with about 88 to 100% runoff, depending. Right. Right. And um, I've seen it when it's been raining for a month, and I dig down, and six inches down, it's bone dry in the soil. Right. And if any of you have ever tried to get, like, powder, dry powder wet, it, it's actually <laughs> quite hard. Right. So swales are basically contoured ditches. They can be any size. You can do it with a shovel. You can do it with a bulldozer. But you you dig um, a shelf or that's kind of banked into the hill mm -hmm. uh, to harvest the water, not shunt it, but harvest it, mm -hmm. so that it, it fills up like a bathtub when it's raining and then oh, slowly infiltrates into the ground. And the beauty of that is if it's done on scale, you can recharge your aquifers. Mm -hmm. So so many people are digging wells and relying on wells for their water, but there's no recharge system going on. Right. Because it's all compacted and you're getting all the runoff and it's going out to the storm drains and out to the sea and getting salted as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Where instead, you take that and you slow it down, you spread it out on the landscape and you sink it mm -hmm. into the ground or let it infiltrate and it can also feed the roots of trees. Um, and it takes a few years. You know, like the first year, you might not see a lot of result, but after three to five years, springs will start slowing again. Mm -hmm. Trees can be off of irrigation. They can be, you know, we have one of the longest se dry seasons in the world, but our most uh, now that our trees are established, we can, they can get water off the swales. And, and it creates a lens under the soil mm -hmm. that will stay there for virtually ever. It's just like an underground tank. It's nice. just that you've got, it's got soil particles in there right, instead exactly. of being like a tank. Nice. But that also helps purify the water because the bacteria in the soil right. can help clean the water. And um, it's, a, it's a great system. Yeah, nature is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you're just working with nature, working yeah. with gravity, working with soil profile, working with slope. But, you know, it took machines and large large equipment and large animals that created the damage. Mm -hmm. So we sometimes need machines or large animals, like horses maybe, 
to repair the damage. Yeah. Um, so we're not talking about doing any of this in a pristine situation. We're mm-hmm. talking about going into degraded, you know, dehydrated situations and landscapes and doing it there and doing earth repair work where it's needed. Perfect. So this leads yeah. this leads me to my next question. Uh, and that is because uh-huh. we're we're jumping around all around permaculture here. What is your definition of permaculture? Well, my definition, I have sort of a one liner, mm-hmm. I guess, like run on sentence. <laughs> 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 that is um, that permaculture is a design science rooted in observation of natural systems that aid us in designing human settlements that have the stability and resiliency of a natural ecosystem. Wow. I know it's a run-on sentence. Well, it is, but it's so right on. I did my first permaculture design course in 1991, and you just summed it up there for me. (laughs) Yeah, because, I mean, we do kind of consider it to be a science because the only difference between, say, permaculture science and reductionist a conventional science uh-huh. a lot of science they like to look at things in isolation mm-hmm. and what we like to observe are the interconnections yeah. between the elements mm-hmm. and that's what we you know how it all works together right and that's what to me is what's really exciting about permaculture is it's it's really uh, an integrated truly whole systems non-dogmatic uh-huh solutionary approach to oh my gosh that was beautiful that was beautiful what you just said (laughs) so how does a somebody that's never done a permaculture course an intro to permaculture anything how do they get started well that's a good question because it really depends on where you are but i would suggest i would highly recommend to find a reputable residential permaculture design course. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of really good online courses, mm-hmm. but really, if you're really new to it, I think it's much better to have an in-person yes. immersion. Yeah. And the way that people teach them traditionally is they're usually, a good one's usually 14 or 15 days over two weeks mm-hmm. with a day off, and you go and you stay at a farm or at a, a venue, and you... Um, Immerse. You get fed and you yeah. get taught, and and they like our courses. We go I'll do a lot of theory in the morning, and then we do get out and do the hands-on hands on. practicum in the afternoon. Yeah. Often they involve tours to nearby permaculture sites. Now there are some. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, but that would be the best way to start it because then you're like having face face time with right. real people. Online courses. I'm not. I think there are some good ones, and there's also some really, they're sort of all over the map in terms of the quality, and I think Mm -hmm. it would be really hard for um, people to to know if they're getting a good one. Well, I think there's a a certain amount of, I'm going to even shift that and say there's a large amount of community that gets created in the space of a residential permaculture design course that is really important. and. So for me at Urban Farm U, we do online courses, like Toby does one with us, and uh, mm-hmm. but I don't ever see us doing an online PDC because there's that valuable community building piece. Yeah, and there's been the PDC, as it's, which is the permaculture design, some people use certification course, uh-huh. uh, PDC, is, it's almost like an international global brand. Yes where you get a certificate at the mm-hmm. end, you do a design project, there's a standard curriculum, um, and it's been surprisingly well maintained over the last 25 plus years, more, more than that, more than almost that 30 now. years. Yeah. yeah, 30 plus years. And it, But there are some, there are a few bogus, you know, courses out there, so you, I think people need to do their due diligence and just get, you know, go online and go to forums or something and get, um, you know, Other people's a input, little maybe? vetting yeah. before they attend a course. And if somebody's got a good reputation, there's many, many beautiful, awesome permaculture teachers throughout the country that and have yeah. um, awesome reputations. And the other thing, too, is I've been doing international courses, and that is super fun. 
Um, oh, I'll yes. probably be doing one in um, Brazil. In, oh, nice. Or not in Brazil, I'm sorry, in Peru. Uh-huh. And I've done a couple in Bali, and I did one in Peru already. And it, what you get is you get, like, indigenous Quechua people with, you know, people from Manhattan and Hong Kong and, <laughs> you know, Brazil right. and, you know, Mexico and U.S. and Europe. And you just get, like, this... And having... The conversation of permaculture is so juicy, and especially to have like an indigenous person and somebody mm-hmm. from Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the the humanity is is the same all over the not the same, but you know, we're all yeah. human. We're all we're humans. All share yeah. similar values, and um, especially in permaculture classes, and and uh, yeah, the solutions really vary whether you're in the Sacred Valley of Peru or whether you're in you Manhattan. know Los Angeles. Yeah. But people start getting ideas. We we give them a toolkit mm-hmm. so that they can take it and apply it to an urban context or to, you know, wow, rural or where wherever tropical. Yeah, it transcends climate. Permaculture does and transcends mm-hmm. class. You know, transcends culture really because right. Um, it can the principles apply anywhere. Yeah. Well, I'm, we're doing a permaculture design course with uh, Dan Dorsey from Tucson here in Phoenix mm-hmm. this fall. Mm-hmm. And um, you mentioned putting different uh, cultures together. I'm really excited. We have a 16-year-old girl coming over from Liberia, Africa. Wow. To be in our course. And, you know, it was like that that just, it's a little bit mind-blowing for me. And it's so cool. I'm really excited about that for this fall's that's course. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. That's yep. really cool. So I'm going to shift a little bit on you, and I want to know about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Wow. that's. I know. It's a fun question yeah. to ask. Well, there's a number of things. I would say, some. I would say, I don't know if they, see, I don't consider things failure. Uh-huh. Like, that word, is, it's more of a learning curve. Uh, absolutely. But... I mean, one one thing I can think of that I did is I planted, I got, like, really overzealous with my first permaculture food forest uh-huh. and planted so many fruit trees that I was, like, saucing and chutneying and drying and chopping and <laughs> juicing and you name it um, oh, yeah. for every weekend until I was like, I can't even, I can't deal with this anymore. Like, mm-hmm. we just had to open the gates and let the deer in because... <laughs> There was so much food there. There's, there's so much food. So, yeah. so I want to, I don't know if you, it's not really a failure. It's more, but um, that's one thing. And then also, in terms of the teaching front, I think teaching composting is really hard. Mm-hmm. It's ha- way harder than I ever thought it would be. Yeah. And, you know, you'd think a oh, compost happens, but uh-huh. um, I, I, I watch people try to compost after I compost, you know, I wouldn't say it's a fail, but I I would say that I think I had failed, and then, um, and I realized what I have to do is I have to compost with people uh, Uh numerous times, and then I think they have to fail, and when they do, Mm -hmm. the pattern has been that they usually blame the pile, (laughs) but... Like they're like it wasn't anything they did wrong. It was like oh, and then you go and you dig it up, and then they've got like food scraps that are like a foot thick, you know, right. and it's all this anaerobic mess. Yeah. So yeah, but the, um, composting, teaching composting is is a real thing. I know Elaine Ingham and some of these uh, master soil scientists. I mm-hmm. mean, they have like online courses on composting that are like two thousand dollars. Right. Or and I'm starting to understand why. Why, exactly. It's way more complicated than, than you might think to do it properly. And right. So shout out to, to Elaine and all the people that are oh, studying yeah. microorganisms. Mm-hmm. And I, I do good compost piles, but it um, took me a long time to figure out how to teach it to others. Yeah. Well, composting... So that would be a failure. I'm trying yeah. to think if there's any other... Well, watery things because no uh, all the water mm-hmm. that we've done have been really good well both um, of those both of those things that you shared about um 
both the abundance of fruit and the abundance of you know anaerobic microorganisms really for me speak to how nature works and I tell mm -hmm. people all the time that there there's only one place on the planet where lack lives it's between our ears <laughs> Be, yeah, right. right because when we yeah. look when we look to nature there is this absolutely amazing abundance and you found it in both places yeah and then and then it's kind of the the stocking principle around you know making sure that you have a use for right. what you produce mm -hmm. and uh and then you know you can always organize and there's food banks and there's all that stuff but if you're yeah. working you're busy and you know, i'm like to just go pick all that stuff and put them in boxes and drive them into the city or whatever you know that that's a solution but it also takes additional time time exactly to swing that but it you know yeah you know it's a it's a it's, a t it's there are worse problems to have <laughs> exactly. than that. Exactly. Well, one of the courses we teach at Urban Farm U includes a whole session on what do you do with all that abundance? Because if, right. we, if we can put systems in place before that abundance arrives, where I've found that I'm much more successful at, at harvesting and managing it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, well, we, we, what we've had out here with community gardens and stuff is people like to come out from the city and they're all about planting and getting the garden in, but they, they're not so big on the harvesting part of it, right. which is really surprising. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell people 50% of being a farmer is harvesting and processing it and getting it someplace. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so what do you consider your biggest success? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, I think the Commonwealth Garden here is a mm -hmm. tremendous success. Mm -hmm. It has, we've influenced probably six to 7,000 people here. Wow. Um, That's amazing. And yeah, and we teach, because we're doing not only the permaculture aspects and skill building, but mm -hmm. we're also doing deep nature connection. We're doing leadership. We just started one a program here called the Art of Vitality with our doctor, mm -hmm. who is the community doctor here, who is an, she's uh, into integrated medicine, and mm -hmm. so she's going to be running programs out of the garden. And then I'm also starting an herbal medicine making program and distillation workshops wow. here, where you can just walk out and you can meet the plants and see them. And and so we've been doing this for about 12 years, and now we're in the harvest of it you know things are established mm. and and i would say that this would be one of my biggest successes and i also think teaching has been very successful for me i think what the student I, I would say my students and and not only my students but the people they're not my students really because we are always learning from each other yeah but the people who have come through my courses and who I have mentored mm -hmm. have been tremendous success. You know, um, many of them are out there in the leadership world, in permaculture leadership today. Like Making Toby. a difference all over the world, like Toby. Like Toby, yeah. Like Eric Olson in Permaculture Skills Center in Sebastopol mm -hmm. and Star Hawk and oh, so many yes. people. And also Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. Um, I trained Brock in permaculture, Brock Dolman. Oh, no way. And he way. trained wow. me in biology. Yeah. Brock's and a, Brock's a we rock star. taught together for, I don't even know how many courses we taught, but a lot. Yeah. And I was there for between a month, four to six weeks a year for about years there. And that's a thriving budding center. And um, he has acknowledged me as being fundamental and helping yeah. that get going. and. San Francisco Institute of Architecture is another, uh, the ecological design program there is still thriving and happening. So I love it. I yeah. love it how we plant, how we, as a permaculture community, get to plant seeds over the decades, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. Uh, and watch, if you stay put, you can actually watch it fruit. And then uh, seeing my grandbaby playing around in my first permaculture garden that I ever planted in my, my house, mm -hmm. um, oh, that's yes. success, just seeing him knowing... He's two, almost two, and you know he's already learning all the different plants and everything. Yeah. Great. Nice. So, what drives you? <laughs> what drives me? Curiosity. Mm -hmm. I would say would be the biggest thing that I follow. I follow my curiosity. 
I go through like I wonder what would happen if and I like that I'm also um, the things that attract me are anything relating to alchemy oh yes and that includes anything from making olives to making cheese and cooking Mm -hmm. to making medicine and distilling um, hydrosols and essential oils or converting, you know, it also includes like spinning, taking wool and oh yeah, spinning into and weaving into fit garments and blankets mm-hmm. and taking raw materials and turning them into useful things. Those are the kinds of things that, you know, I don't know what drives me around that, but I'm mm-hmm. just I love that. That's the kind of thing that, when I look at the pattern of my life, pretty much everything, whether you're planting a seed, making compost, making mm-hmm. cheese making medicine, creams, and lotions, whatever. I just love... It's magic. Uh, doing it. it is. It's, it's, it's magic. It's a miracle. It's yeah. miraculous. And it's beautiful, and it's useful. Soap would be another one. I love oh, yeah. making soap. Yeah. And all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm kind of like into the crafty, mm-hmm. crafty things. <laughs> yeah, doing something with all that abundance. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I have kind and of being a, able to walk out your door and have it right there and have it right there. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I have a, a question. I don't ha- normally ask this question, but it just is something's, you know, niggling at me to ask it. And that that's mm-hmm. why. Why should somebody take a permaculture design course? Oh, great question. To develop some ecological literacy, mm-hmm. for one thing, mm-hmm. you know, I think a good course teaches people how the world works. So, for example, mm-hmm. what you know, if you take an engineering class, what we teach in permaculture is almost complete opposite of what they teach in engineering. <laughs> yeah, um, and even in landscape architecture and some of these specialty fields, because engineering, I mean, they like to pipe and pave and get the water. Like water is dangerous, and of course, it's dangerous when you tr- run it straight down a hill on a pipe. Wherever it's going to come out, it's going to fire hose out and erode mm-hmm. the soil and kill salmon in the process by covering their eggs and blah, 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 you know? Right. But permaculture, you start to look at, it brought me away from what I was taught in school to what I know inherently. Mm -hmm. So what happens for people is it just makes sense and it resonates with people. Yeah. Because, you know, they have aha moments a lot. Yeah. And, you know, so there might be one topic a person might be, you know, it might be, you know, uh, solar... In energy, and maybe they know everything about solar energy, but how that all works in relationship to a whole site yeah. design, most people don't know this. Right. I sit on the I sit on the building appeals board mm-hmm. for our county in Marin County, and wow, um, I've just finally been invited to give give the board a, a workshop at our next meeting about permaculture. Oh, because nice. Because the problem is, no, the departments don't talk to each other. Yeah. Like environmental health doesn't talk to the building people, and the building people don't talk to the planning people. Mm-hmm. And the planning people aren't talking to the engineering people, and then none of them are talking to ecologists. And, you know, we've been citing examples all throughout the county where houses have just been put in the wrong places. Yeah. Legitimately, with permits and engineering and experts and people with degrees deciding all this stuff, and and it's just wrong. You know, they're yeah. just in the place where all the water collects on the landscape and all the water is <laughs> running into their house, and they're blaming their neighbors. And it's like, right. actually, no, it's not your neighbor's fault here. It's the way you cited your house, and so they they are now getting really excited about the idea of integrating more. You know. We've yeah. also created an ordinance here where natural buildings are allowed to be built in Marin County. Nice. Through this board. That's, it's not that well known, but people could come at a clubhouse in Marin. We're just waiting for someone to come forward with a project. Project, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. it's, you know, that's that's also a success, I would say, because uh, I, I was unanimously appointed to this board for building appeals for helping people navigate the building process where I've never actually gotten a permit myself. <laughs> <laughs> but they like what I stand for right. and they like what I do exactly. and they've seen the buildings, a small, you know, 120 round feet building where you don't need a building permit that you can build mm-hmm. legally here. They've seen them and they like them and they, they're really interested in wanting to allow things like COP 
construction to be legal. Yeah. Beautiful. How long have you been on that commission? Two years. Oh, good. It's a four-year position. Yeah. And it took him two years to ask you for a permaculture class. Yeah, because I'm not out there, like, tooting my horn or anything. Yeah. But finally, I couldn't stand it anymore because they're talking about, you know, how nobody's talking to each other. I said, well, that's exactly what permaculture is. Yeah. See, everybody thinks it's about agriculture. Yep. I think it's about the garden. Uh-huh. And it's like, no, it's actually about linking disciplines. Right. It's about connecting art and engineering and ecology and agriculture and land use and planning it's all of that together, and that's what they started getting like. I said, this is why it's so exciting for me. And mm-hmm. they said, you know, wow, that does sound exciting. Yeah. Can you tell us more about it? <laughs> that, so, that is a huge win. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm all about education, and I have to know, is there one book uh, or maybe two that has been influential for you in this process? I know. It's one of those well, The designer's manual is, is, is a is a brilliant piece of work mm-hmm. like when I I had to do courses in, I mean I w- was installing farms in Bali in the tropics mm-hmm. and I brought that one book and I'll tell you every time I opened it up I found my answers that I needed because I didn't know anything about uh, tropical oh, agriculture yeah. at the time Right. and I found some angels who taught me so much uh, Balinese people, mm-hmm. but also um, when I had certain questions, I would open up that book and it was almost like, you know, divining, and it would be in there. Um, but I That's know, but based on urban, because there's to bring it back to the urban, there's mm-hmm. some really cool projects out there. One of them that I'm really interested in is it's called the Brooklyn Grange. It's in New oh, York. Oh yes, 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 yes. Do you know about this? Oh, yes. They're producing like 50,000 pounds of food off of two roofs. I Every know. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> but there's a book called um, The Roof Farm, what Brooklyn Grange taught us about entrepreneurship oh, and community and growing cool. sustainable business. And then Farm City by Novella Carpenter is great. Oh, yes. she just tells She just tells her story yeah. about doing it. And there's another one called Food in the City, Urban Agriculture and the New Food Revolution. And that one sounds really good because, you know, a lot of people think permaculture is about, you know, rural, getting back to the land and having, Mm -hmm. you know, your 40 acres. Mm -hmm. But it's actually very potent in the cities. Oh, yeah. Because we have all these resources here that mostly are wasted. Yeah. 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 But if, you know, when things are done right. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, an urban farm could be way more efficient in terms of growing more and less space, mm-hmm. using less resources, high intensive gardening, less waste because you don't have that capacity to just, you know, waste yeah. things when you're in limited space. <laughs> right. And also just having growing food where where it's being consumed. And it's and it's a way that what I love about education is that it can help people who uh don't might might not have a lot of money, but mm-hmm. they can um, if they can learn how to grow their own food in the city. They can actually have access to healthy Healthier food. Healthier food, yeah. But it also you have to then link it into oh well, if you live in a house that's older than 1970, you've got lead all around. Uh, yep, lead paint. <laughs> you know, so you have to be. That's where permaculture courses they they address that whole piece. Yeah. So. Yes, there's growing food, but it's like in the city, how do you grow food? you got to isolate it from the ground in most cases because mm, you just don't right. know what's under there. Exactly. If you want to have healthy food. So that's when I say eco-literacy. I'm thinking of eco coming from the word oikos, which means home. Mm-hmm. So eco-literacy isn't just about, you know, ecology is basically the study of home, right? Right. But thinking of eco as our home and develop, and literacy, I think... Permaculture courses can really aid in helping people understand how things work. Yeah. And then once you understand that, then you can find solutions and you can problem solve and you can, you know, think for yourself in a much more coherent way. You know, rather than having something just be handed to you on right. a silver platter. <laughs> exactly. You get to figure it out that way. I think yeah. we become better, better thinkers in a permaculture design course. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Well, I would say 
Uh, well, I definitely would say if you haven't taken a permaculture class, take one. Mm-hmm. Find a good one and take it. I would also say to follow follow the things that that you love. Like, mm. follow the process that you love to do. Like, if you love people, then figure out ways of creating livelihoods and opportunities for you to work with people. Mm-hmm. If you love just being alone out in the garden, you know, find, develop those kinds of skills. Um, follow your heart, because yeah. that's what keeps us alive and in, mm. impassioned and empowered. And and if it even if it means like doing it in your spare time or, you know, you have to have whatever job, but the the if you can find something useful to do that the world is waiting for, it has value and you will be supported in being able to do that. Yeah. If you develop appropriate skills for that, so that would be one thing. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And we're going to be hosting some. Oh please. We do a. Yeah, we do a a one day a, a month here for so it's mainly for California Bay Area residents, but we do one day a month um permaculture class called Four Seasons. And we're mm. doing an integral permaculture class which is a 3 day a month where people come out here to the garden for 3 days and we pull out all the stops and we're going to be doing everything from it's 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 beyond the PDC, so people have uh-huh. already had a PDC. PDC this is right. an advanced opportunity to then go deeper and learn more about beekeeping and you know gardening and deeper relationship to projects and water harvesting and water purification and but also yoga and qigong and vitality and wow. health and nutrition and biodynamics. You know, we're just going to really go deep. Botany is mm-hmm. another one that people need. Uh, more um, of yeah, absolutely. So we're kind of cherry picking the the ripe fruit that people I think are needing and wanting mm-hmm. in their lives and learning more about, and we're doing that in our integral permaculture program, which is on our website at Perfect. regenerativedesign.org. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you yeah. next. What what courses yeah. do you have coming up, and how do we find out about them? And we're also doing a teacher training. Oh. Um, that's a residential, so people can come from all over. Mm-hmm. We're doing a teacher training from September 3rd through the 11th with Jude Hobbs. Oh, so, that'll be a um, rocking course. One of my first permaculture teachers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be great. So, And that'll be here at this permaculture garden at Commonwealth Garden. And during that, there's also a three-day it's a separate workshop. We're going to have two running simultaneously. I'm doing an art of distillation three days from the 9th through the 11th. I want to do and, that one. Um, yeah, it's like three days. You can fly up or whatever. Yeah. Drive up and undo it. And, yeah, so that's going to be fun. I'm doing that with my friend Jeanette Acosta, mm-hmm. who will bring a lot of the indigenous perspective into the whole workshop, and I bring in the hermetic tradition of Europe into it. And and then we're going to be hosting a um, a seasonal mm-hmm. four times a year starting in March. You know, there's I think in March and then in May and then in August and September where people come out for for three days during this time and um, and we're going to go deep into and then deep into the herbal wisdom, right. plant knowledge, and medicine making. But also then they go home and they are going to create their own herbarium and their own apothecary mm. and then they'll come oh, back nice and then we'll evaluate the yeah. products that they're creating and so it's a it's an they it doesn't end just on the weekend though right they'll make and we'll make you know creams and lotions and gels and powders and wow tinctures and salves and all of the yeah. but learning also the deeper secrets that the plants hold mm-hmm. the, you know for me that i teach and this is why i teach is because I believe that that's where we gain the most value, both in learning when we're teaching and, you know, and learning from the students. And I can clearly see that you do that, too. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Penny. It's been a treat getting to chat with you. You're welcome. This has been really fun, Greg. Yeah, thank you. And so how can our listeners get a hold of you? 
Well, through our website, mm-hmm. um, re- www.regenerativedesign.org. Uh-huh. And my email is just penny at regenerativedesign.org, P-E-N-N-Y, mm-hmm. if they want to contact me directly. But if they, even if they go through the contact us, it will get to me through the website also. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So that's the best way. Perfect, perfect. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Well, you're very welcome, Greg. Thanks for having me. Oh, my gosh, you bet. Okay, take care. Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking. What if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.